Hello, everybody. My name is Mocha Jasmine Johnson. I'm the co-founder of Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. So the board, I'm also on the Board of Elections for the athens Clark County Democrats. Let me hear it one time. I got to keep my eyes open on the votes, okay? So a few years ago, my husband and I started Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, and I jumped into activism to fight for civil rights, to push back against hate to fight for criminal justice reform. And throughout the process, one of the, one of the counties was Clarkston that we continuously referenced to. Before we got a progressive mayor and commission in place, we had a lot of no's. <laughs> you know, we would go up there advocating and we'll get a lot of no's and pushback. But I knew Clarkson was doing something. It was making a difference, and it was something that I could refer to, and it would give me hope to keep pushing and keep fighting for justice and equity. So, in that spirit, it is my pleasure to introduce a man who is no stranger to being bold and fearless. I'm pretty bold and fearless, too, so I can recognize bold and fearless. When he was elected, he became the youngest man Clarkston. His work has become a model for progressives everywhere who want to see more equitable, diverse, and just future. He has also paved the way with the visionary policies that include decriminalizing marijuana, transitioning renewable energy, raising the minimum wage, and making election day a holiday. We might need to do that here in Athens, Clark County. I'm just gonna put that out there. And perhaps, most importantly, recognizing that Southern hospitality means welcoming refugees, immigrants, and asylums. That's why Clarkson is known to be the most diverse square mile in America and the Ellis Island of the South. He is the director of Georgia Chapter of Sierra Club, and he was notably featured in Netflix Queer Eye. We got a star in the house, y'all. <laughs> he is running for David Perdue's seat in the United States Senate. So my Democrats, are y'all ready? No matter what happens, we have to stand together. The only way we're gonna take this house back is by being cohesive, is by being bold, is by being fearless, because it's time for the Democrats to take the seat back. And because I'm sick and tired of seeing what they're doing up there, I want to introduce Ted Terry. Thank you, Mo. Mayor Ted, welcome. Welcome. So good to see you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Darshan. Well, Ted, I mean, you walked in. I saw you. Hadn't seen you in a while, hardly at all, you know. And I said, how you been doing? You're like, man, it's a big state, Spencer. <laughs> it's a big what state. you been doing? <laughs> it's a big state. It is a big state. Tell us, tell us how it's been going, uh, traveling around this big state. I know you've been spending a lot of work talking with the uh, families in the state. Tell us what's going on, what, what they're telling you. Yes, there are 159 counties in Georgia, in case you didn't know that. I think Texas only d d beats us in number of counties. Um, but you know, I've been traveling and working um, uh, for the progressive movement in Georgia since I moved here uh, over 15 years ago. And so I um, have visited a lot of these places in my past work, whether it was for um, Jane Kidd's state senate race here in 2006 when I was the field director working for the state Democratic Party, uh, training candidates and county committees on this newfangled uh, device and database called Vote Builder, uh, <laughs> working for Congressman John Barrow for two election cycles, uh, running a statewide campaign for the Public Service Commission when Steve Oppenheimer ran in 2012, um, working for the Georgia AFL-CIO and then the, the director of the Georgia Sierra Club, and then in 2013 running for mayor of the city of Clarkston, Georgia, um, and then in, also in that same time period I ran for the vice chair 
chair of candidate recruitment for the state Democratic Party and was just uh, elected in January as the first vice chair of the state Democratic Party. Uh, so I literally have been traveling this state for over a decade. And to the answer to your question is when you get the opportunity to go to meet people where they're at and to listen to them. And that's a big part of what my political philosophy is. Uh, we need to do more li listening and less talking. And when you uh, listen to people uh, and you listen enough, you begin to hear where they're coming from. And you begin to hear where we're actually saying the same thing and we're talking and we, we share the similar values and ideas and the vision of our future. And, and I'm always reminded of that Maya Angela quote. She said that most people won't remember what you, what you told them, what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And that's a big aspect and I think a big um, principle that we have to take as Democrats is we're not going to educate our way into an election victory, um, but we can work our way to an election victory by listening to people, by, by going and knocking on every single door, by going to the places and the voters, talking to the voters that don't usually get engaged, who feel like they've been forgotten. And that means conservative voters. It means um, communities of color, marginalized communities. It means young voters, people who have been disenfranchised. We have to go and reach out to them. That's basically what um, Stacey Abrams um, ran her campaign on. And she released uh, the Abrams Playbook in, aug in August. Um, and it was very clear, don't just focus on the narrow slice of the likely persuadable voters. Talk to all the voters in every single county. And so that's what I'm doing. Uh, it's a lot of mileage, a lot of windshield time. Um, my staff have given me this um, call time system, so like I, every time I'm in, on the road, I have to dial into the call time system and call people for money. Unfortunately, strangers for money. So I haven't called you yet. You're on the call list. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. So um, Ted is from my home county of DeKalb County, where I was born and raised. Um, but I specifically wanted to talk to you about Clarkson because of the things that you have done. I think is one of the most diverse or the most diverse um, per square foot of, of how many nationalities do you have in, in, in Clarkson? Yeah, 40 nationalities, 60 well, languages. Yeah, so you probably have a very unique perspective on this immigration reform issue and some of the things that um, David Perdue's BFF Trump has been saying around this issue. So talk to the, the crowd about how you are going to distinguish yourself. It's not going to be too hard, but what is your messaging going to be um, against David Perdue and the rhetoric that's coming out of the Republican Party for immigrants and people who have contributed to the state? Yeah, well, um, you know, Clarkson is known as the most ethnically diverse square mile in America, and the reason why is we've been welcoming refugees, asylum seekers, immigrants for the last 40 years. And so you can literally chart the course of human and world events going back to the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Um, people who have fled violence, persecution because of their religion, their political affiliation, their ethnicity, um, cartel violence, and increasingly climate disruption. And Clarkston has welcomed people from those countries. Uh, to start their lives over as new Americans. And what I can say unequivocally is as refugee resettlement and immigration increased in Clarkston, the crime rate went down. As our diversity increased, Clarkston became one of the fastest growing suburbs in the entire country. We are proof that a more diverse community can work. And this is a big part of the narrative is that immigrants are coming to replace America, to replace all of us. And what they're really saying is it's, you know, they're replacing the white people, okay? Now, what I can say in Clarkston is we still celebrate the 4th of July, Veterans Day. We even have Santa Claus come in on a fire truck. Now, we don't shoot fireworks off on the 4th of July because fireworks are really expensive. Um, but we did learn something a few years ago uh, that on July 5th, fireworks are buy one, get two free. <laughs> so a little fiscal responsibility there. We shoot off our fireworks for Christmas celebration. <laughs> and interwoven in that is celebration of the Ethiopian New Year, um, Ramadan, the Karen New Year, the ethnic and cultural celebrations that our constituents' um, home country celebrates. 
And we can proudly say that, um, that this is something that's made us stronger. Um, Mark Twain said that travel is fatal to bigotry, prejudice, and narrow-mindedness. And one cannot develop broad, wholesome views of the world by vegetating in one's own corner for one's entire life. The bumper sticker is, travel is the only cure for ignorance. And in Clarkston, you get an opportunity to travel, and I've had the opportunity to, to campaign. I'm the twice-elected mayor of the most ethnically diverse square mile in America. Uh, I'm the minority, and I have built a coalition, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-racial, who have not only voted me in once, but twice, and have supported me in the progressive change that we've sought, um, all while focusing on bringing people together not by focusing on dividing us. And that is the message I'm bringing to this campaign in the United States Senate. That's an incredible message, because sure, it's, it's extremely divisive right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sure all appreciate that. Um, tell us about, you know, we've touched on uh, some of your stuff locally. Tell us, why should we be worried that all of a sudden it goes from 100 to 24? in four days, and why do we care that the oceans are rising? Talk about the climate change and how we can change it. Don't tell me what you believe, show me what you have done, and then I will tell you what you believe. And as mayor, I've tried to lead by example. Uh, not only have I worked to expand solar energy in Georgia, I've actually advocated and organized around three integrated resource plans at the Public Service Commission. 2016, um, 20, no, 2013, 2016, and then most recently in the summer of 2019. And every year we have organized a broad coalition of Georgians who have said that solar energy is the best investment that Georgia can make. And we actually didn't lead with climate change, Spencer. We led with actually solar will bend the cost curve on utility rates. It's clean energy and it's cheaper energy. And by the way, the investments in parts of Georgia that haven't seen any investment in decades, where people are literally leaving, where the populations are aging, are seeing new life breathed into those communities because of solar energy. It's increasing, it's creating, creating jobs, it's increasing tax values, it's funding their school boards, and this is not a, do you believe in climate change or not question, it's do you believe in economic development in a state that is the third best potential for solar energy? You know, we're the Texas or the Saudi Arabia of solar energy. We not only can produce all the solar energy that our electrons will ever need, but we can make so much solar energy that we can export it to other states. That is a win-win for our, for our state of Georgia and for parts that have been forgotten. Um, now, when you talk about climate change, I don't know if y'all read the New York Times on Sunday. I, I get the New York Times on Sunday. Um, and there was a, a good article I shared on my Twitter page. Um, and you kind of get this sort of like, you know, out there talking to people is, you know, do people believe in climate change, right? And I think sometimes we get kind of confused because we're trying to convince people to believe in climate change. But what the surveys have actually showed us it's not necessarily that they believe or disbelieve in, in climate change, is that they don't think that the scientific community has consensus on it. 17% of Americans rightly believe and, and know that 99% of climate scientists say that man-made global warming is happening and that we have to do something to reverse it. 45%, 33%, somewhere in the middle, those 70% of Americans think that there's some sort of disagreement amongst the scientific community. And so this is part of you know, our campaigning. We need to make sure that people know that the scientists are saying global warming is happening. It's increasing droughts and floods, superstorms, and we are paying for it. And if we don't invest in reversing global warming, in creating a modern grid, investing in clean energy, and creating a more resilient community, we are going to pay for it in the trillions of dollars. And so when I talk about a Green New Deal, I'm talking about investing in a future that will pay 
multiple trillions of dollars in dividends. It'll create a full employment economy. It'll create investment in parts of our country that we haven't seen. It will connect our, our, our cities and our counties with passenger rail, with high-speed rail. It will weatherize and energy efficientize our buildings from residential to commercial to industrial. That was great. <laughs> I just keep going on and no, on. No, I, I know you can, and that's I'm such good stuff, that. and that's why I asked that question, because you know, the, you're, you're talking about an actual economy, not necessarily fighting a climate change concept. You're talking about creating jobs all across this country, and that's great, so we appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Ted. Um, so my question is um, a question that I wanted to ask all the candidates, but we're short on time. So. A lot of times, and especially under the legislature, everybody blames uh, the legislature for always concentrating on the 13 metro counties, like nobody exists outside of 13 metro counties. So we're in Athens now, and obviously you have to travel throughout the state. So is your message to rural Georgia going to be different than metro, or is it going to be the same? And what is that message going to be when we know that health care tends to be worse in, in rural counties? And Sometimes they feel left out because all of our bills in, center around the metro um, the metro area. So, what is your your message to rural Georgia? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think so. The, number one, no, the message isn't different depending on what county you're at. Um, I think you know, again, to go back to Stacey Abrams' campaign, um, you know, you need to talk to all the voters. And you need to run as an unapologetic Democrat. We don't need to be going into red counties and apologizing for wanting to create a universal health care system, for investing in their communities, whether it's regenerative agriculture or solar energy. Uh, we don't need to be apologizing, campaigning on canceling student debts and, and free and de 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 debt-free public colleges and technical systems. How many technical colleges and, um, and universities are out there that are the number one employer in those counties? The school board is the number one employer in a lot of our counties, failing and closing rural hospitals. These issues are, are things that Democrats can win on. And the status quo right now from the Republicans is we want to take away their health care. We don't want to actually make education more affordable. We don't actually want to help our farmers. Um, and you know, based on the trade war and the tariffs, um, and so, you know, we have to, you know, not be afraid to offend some people. And, you know, look, we're not going to win everyone over. We're not going to turn Jeff Davis County from a 15% Democratic performing county, you know, into a 50% one. But guess what? There's people out there that haven't heard our message. And, you know, when I've learned this working in Democratic politics, because uh, we've had a lot of losses over the years. It's great that we're starting to win some these days. Um, but uh, voters really need to hear from us. Um, and we can't just expect that we're gonna just win elections by dragging people to the polls. That's sort of our, kind of our mindset you know, in the past. We need to send them running to the polls um, to support candidates that stand with them on the issues. And we're not going to win all those counties, but if we increase the margins, if we increase turnout, if we talk about the low propensity voters, if we talk about the 310,000 new Georgia res residents who have moved from other parts of the country who have not yet registered, we need to be go, to go and talking to them right now. And in about three weeks, I'll um, uh, release, um, I got my data geeks working on a, what's basically, it's called Map the Vote. Um, and any Democratic County Committee will be able to log on to this system. And actually, any of y'all will be able to log on to this system, pull up your address, and we have pinpointed those 300 and plus thousand new Georgia residents who have not yet registered to vote. And we also think they're more likely to be Democrat based on matching data from other voter files all over the country. And so we don't have to wait to have a Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate. We can actually start welcoming these new Georgia residents to our neighborhoods. All right. And I know, I mean, I may be old fashioned, but let's you know, start the welcome wagon again. Let's bring someone some apple pies. Welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, and I want to ask you to register to vote. 
And uh, you know, you can register online. You can register, you know, via Turbo Vote. Here's a voter registration form. I'm sure you can get from the Board of Elections. Oh, and by the way, you know, get involved with the Democratic County Committee. Here are the candidates running for Senate, for State House, for Congress, um, for President. And we need to begin to engage those voters because the electorate math is such that we're not going to win over that many. Trump voters, all right? Um, we need to expand the electorate. And we do that by going after and talking directly to those voters who have been waiting for the candidates that stand with them on the issues to come knock on their door and run on those issues. Yeah, that's good stuff. I'm trying to, you know, lay back a little bit and get comfortable. Still wanting to jump up and dance around here. Hey, we got some exciting candidates. Um, so, uh, in, in your city, you were able to raise the minimum wage. Now, how important is our labor community to the whole entire United States, and how do you view the value of our workers in this country? Well, I can. Um First, share with you that uh, I was lucky enough uh, to graduate um, college with almost no debt. And I was able to do that because I got a partial scholarship, um, but I had to work my way through college uh, to pay for sort of the, all the in betweens. And at the time, I was uh, going to become like a, a nurse's assistant or a, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. And so I was told, okay, well, you got to put in your 2,000 you know, hours of clinical service. And so the way to do that was to work as a nursing assistant. So I worked for three years at a nursing home as a CNA. And I actually discovered early on that I was not cut out for the medical profession because one day the phlebotomist came in and asked me to help hold down the arm of a, of a patient so they could draw blood. And upon the sight of blood um, being drawn, I almost you know, fainted. <laughs> Um, so I realized that that, that wasn't going to work, um, but it actually was a really good job, and it was a good job because we were organized. We were in the SEIU local. Um, we had uh, bargained for basically what they called the California overtime rules, and it said that if you worked a double shift or overtime, you got paid time and a half. And so as a college student, and this was in 2002, three, and four, I made $17 an hour working a double shift from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. every Saturday for three years. And I was able to de graduate debt-free because I had a union job. Fast forward years later, I was the campaign director and the lobbyist for the Georgia AFL-CIO. So I worked two legislative sessions, uh, lobbying on two major pieces of legislation. One, um, raising the minimum wage. Uh, to $15 an hour. Um, we got one hearing on that. <laughs> and I, uh, I remember uh, testifying, you know, actually as a mayor at the time on this. And I was challenged by uh, Senator uh, David Schaefer at the time. He's now the head of the, the Georgia Republican Party. And he said, well, if you like the $15 wage so much, Mayor, then why don't you do it in your, in your city? And I was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> and so that's what we did. We raised the minimum wage for our city employees to $15 an hour. It was three years ago. Okay. And guess what's happened? Uh, worker turnover rate is really low. Morale is high. Motivation is high. Um, and they've also gotten pay raises since then. I mean, that's the thing, you know, cost of living has gone up. Three years ago, $15 an hour was the minimum wage living in Metro Atlanta. It's gone up. Housing has gone up, education, childcare, um, uh, transportation costs, all of that has, grown, has gone up. Um, but it was the right thing to do. Um, and I would argue that actually um, paying workers what they're worth, valuing them as workers, um, actually saves money in the long run for corporations. That's why you see you know, the larger corporations, uh, Gas South was one around the same time that created a, that, you know, implemented a $15 minimum wage for their employees um, because it was just the smart thing to do. It kept workers there and kept them happy and kept them productive. All Thank right. you for that. Well, we're going to give you some lasting remarks. Um, so if you had anything else that we didn't ask that you wanted everyone to know about, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was hoping you were going to ask me what my top three priorities were going to be. Um, <laughs> uh, number one, I, I asked for y'all's votes. Um, I asked for you to join this, um, this campaign. 
Uh, it is a progressive movement. It's simple as that. Um, elections come and go, um, and I want to win this election. I want to win a lot of elections in 2020. Uh, but in 2021, there's another election. In 2022, there's another election. Um, we need to be in the movement building mindset. And the Democratic Party here at athens Clark County, I think has proven that if you begin to organize around an election, but you don't stop the organizing, you continue talking to people, knocking on doors, engaging people, you have to ask people to be involved. Um, this is what this campaign is about. We're running on the issues that people want us to run on. And we're not being afraid. Um, we're going to be bold. We're going to be visionary. Um, so I ask that you, you vote for me, that you join our campaign. Um, TedForGeorgia.com is our website. Um, I'm Mayor Ted Terry. I'm for Georgia. I'm for you. Um, and then let me answer the question that I wished you had asked, my top three priorities. And this, is, this comes from me being a mayor. Um, and, you know, I kind of, I'm in, always in the mindset of, like, we got to get things done. All right? And so, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of big, bold ideas out there. There's a lot of things um, that we can, that I think will inspire a lot of voters uh, to volunteer, to donate, to turn out and vote. Um, but the practical reality is you need votes to pass legislation. And so here's the top three um, that I think we need to be doing when we take back the United States Senate in 2020. Number one, we heard uh, last Tuesday that um, the Virginia legislature has flipped to Democratic control. And so we expect them to be the last state needed to ratify the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Are you all following that? Okay. Now, a little legal nuance there. Um, the ratification date was supposed to have been completed by like 1982 or something. All right. So, and there's legal arguments about whether that actually stands or not. But we need the House and Senate to pass legislation that says the ratification date doesn't matter, the ERA amendment can pass, and we can amend the Constitution to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. That will pave the way for groups like the ACLU to begin tackling discrimination um, at all levels. Number two. I am, I'll be the first person to tell you that our democracy is corrupt, that the people who have the money and the power and the influence run Washington. And so, yeah, let's uh, you know, pass a constitutional amendment to um, overturn Citizens United. But that's not the first thing I'm going to propose, uh, because as you just heard, it, it's taken like 40 years to pass the ERA. All right, passing a constitutional amendment just takes a long time. And I don't want to wait. I don't, have, I don't have time to wait. And so what we need to do is implement a public financing of our elections. And you've, it's a combination of what's passed in HR 1 with voting rights reforms, same-day registration. Congress actually can regulate uh, the federal elections. And so we can actually preempt uh, congressional gerrymandering across this country just by passing a bill. We'll ensure that the House of Representatives actually has a fair playing field, regardless of who controls the state legislatures. Um, but you've seen this, the, the number one, uh, two priority should be to increase the power of the ordinary worker, the ordinary person. And we've seen this in other uh, cities. It's a democracy bucks program. We need to have a tax rebate system that gives every person in this room $500 to $1,000 that they can transfer through a democracy buck system to donate to their candidate, federal candidate of their choice. Tens of millions of Americans would be able to equalize the Koch brothers, the, the Michael Bloombergs of the world, um, the Sheldon Adelsons of the world, the billionaires that are running our um, elections and our democracy. Those are as a small tweak that we can do to equalize the, the money in our political system. Um, and I forgot number three, actually, so I'll just leave it right there. Give it up for Ted Terry. Thank you, Ted. Thanks.